Yeah. And then we have the regional vice chairman, Mr. Zamal Hussein, and we have the REO, Mr. Narendra Prasad. And then we have some other persons from the region, the regional uh, executive officer here, we have the deputy, we have the regional engineer, we have the GWI representative, and we have representatives from other agencies within the region. And of course we have your very own uh, chair chairman of the NDC here with us as well. We have Dr. Bob from the Amsterdam Hospital, the CEO, and we also have some uh, officials from the Ministry of Natural Resources as well. As I speak, the President has instructed his cabinet to go across, right across the length and breadth of this country, to meet with residents in every area and in every region to discuss issues affecting them and to also talk to them about the recently concluded budget that was passed in the National Assembly for $1.146 trillion. It's the biggest budget to have ever presented and passed in this country. Many people might want to ask the question, since this is the biggest budget ever to be passed in National Assembly, and this is the highest amount of money that is going to be spent in, in this country in a calendar year, what is it that we can look forward to? And that's a legitimate question. You have a right to ask that question. What are some of the things that we can expect in this region and in this country that will improve the lives of every single person sitting here and outside of here? And I think you would want to know that. There are many benefits to be accrued and already we are seeing over the last three years the government has made tremendous movement in terms of improving the lives of every citizen in this country. And nobody can doubt that. If there's anybody here who wants to say no, you can raise your hand and do that now. So nobody can say that. Every single village, every single area, there is some improvement or the other. We have more work to do. So I would first of all ask the MP responsible for this region, region number six. He's also the Director General in the Ministry of health. So if you are health this you guys are right now for talk to this afternoon. Right, so now we invite Dr. Mario to speak to you. Thank you, Governor Chair. Honorable Minister, who is my colleague, my comrade, my friend, Governor Zamal, Governor Ario, NDC Chair, Councillors, Dr. Bob, CEO. I am honored to be here today. And like Chairman would have said, we are here as part of our mandate. And that mandate not only came with this budget, but it has been there since the promises that we made for elections. We are not an election party. We are not going to come to you only when we have to go to elections. We are here with you all the time. Every week you could find I was looking at some statistics last year when I made my budget speech. These three gentlemen here along with their team, they would have done over 500 meetings last year. So over 600 meetings for them. Going in the communities, meeting with people, hearing their issues, taking their costs, very little praise. But that is how the PAP functions. Minister Vikram Bharat, Minister Mustafa, Minister Ashni Singh and other ministers are here every weekend, not nearly every weekend. Every weekend you'll find a minister or two in region six. So we are here with you all the time throughout the region. We might not come to this particular street, but we are here. The reason why we are here is because you are our ears and our eyes on the ground. You know what is happening. You know the election promises, the promises that we made. You know the manifesto promises that we made. And you have to help us to keep it. I'll tell you, for example, at the last meeting, somebody raised an issue about doctors at Port Moran Hospital. Port Moran Hospital at one time used to run with one doctor. I'm sure you could remember that, some of you. Then we increased it to two. 
I, when the complaint was made, Minister, I called the doctor in charge of Port Morantos. And he said they have eight doctors now working at Port Morantos. So that's not the ophthalmology hospital. The Port Morant hospital itself has eight doctors working here. Never before. Right? They have an obstetrician gynecologist working there. Then the ophthalmology hospital. For five years, they were not doing any cataract surgery. Five years, they were not doing any pterygiums. They were not doing any surgeries there. When we came in, the equipment was not working. The building had what we just call kai, fungus, mold on the wall in the theater. We had to take off all of that. We had to rehabilitate it. We spent over $200 million to fix it. We came into office in... August 2020, and by February 2021, we started doing back surgeries. We don't have a backlog anymore. We are bringing people out from the different regions, from Region 9, from the Northwest, from Region 8. We are bringing people to do their cataract surgery. So we are a party, we keep our promises. We are a government that keeps its promises. We don't make promises that we don't keep. Additionally, the president and the vice president, they were here six times each last year for community meetings and for other activities more than six times. Right? So you could meet with them, you could talk with them, and we, we are here to hear what are your issues. You know what are our plans, where the health sector is concerned. When we took over office, we had like about 14 to 20 percent drugs and medical supplies in this region. I remember, Chairman, you remember the time when you called me from Port Mar from Skeldon Hospital in 2013 because a gentleman called you to complain that he had one tablet. And when you check his prescription, he had 12 tablets on the prescription, 12 different medicines. He had one, and he cussed my audio and Armogan from inside the hospital to the road. But I write to Right? <laughs> no, that's what I'm going to say. It is correct because we raised the expectations. We said we are going to provide these things. And so this is why we are saying, if you, when you go to the health center, when you go to the hospital, there's a number that is there on the wall. In fact, in Port Grant, it's outside the, outside the compound, on the, on the gate. You call that number if you have any issues at any time. We are healthcare deliveries concerned, right? We have over 80, over 90% drugs and medical supplies now. What, we can, what cannot be supplied from central government the REO chairman, vice chairman, they got to make sure they supply it from here. So we have a double system in which we try to make sure that everybody gets their drugs and medical supplies. We might run out of some time for a brief period, but it should not be sustained. Right? We are building new hospitals. Whatever is being offered at New Amsterdam Hospital, all the surgeries, all the theaters, CT scan and all of that, will now be offered at Skeleton. The new hospital we are building in Skeleton. In New Amsterdam, we are building a new hospital that will be better than the current Georgetown Hospital. All of the, the, what we call a cat lab, where you do the heart surgeries and all of that in Georgetown, we'll have our own cat lab in New Amsterdam, where patients who are getting heart problems and possible heart attack, where they get blockage, and so they can get the surgery done right here. Georgetown Hospital doesn't have an MRI. But the new New Amsterdam Hospital will have an MRI. So we are taking things further. This hospital will be completed sometime in 2026. It has already started. The hospital in, in, in uh, Skeldon 75 Village should be completed by the by end of 2025. So we are we are building and we are fulfilling our promises. Right? But we need you to help us to monitor that what we promise, we are delivering. I hope you would have listened to the budget speech because if you did, you would have heard all the good things that are there in the budget for you. And you would also hear, there will be people in, among us who will be complaining, no matter what you do for them, no matter how much you get them, it's still not enough. Right? But we will still do what we promised to do and we will still do our best and we will still give our, our best. And we need you to help us to do that. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. And I know Chair was going to say Dr. Barajak Dio. <laughs> <laughs> I've, been, I've, been to, I've been to, I actually just returned from India from a conference. And a man came to me and said, you know Barajak Dio? 
I said, no, I'm Vikram Bharat. <laughs> so even in India, they made the same mistake too. Because he's familiar with Dr. Bharat Jagdio, who is known worldwide. Even a man from Fiji came to me and said that he and Dr. Jagdio are personal friends. Because they have been to so many conferences around the world. Anyway, let me say first of all that I'm happy to be here this afternoon in Port Moran. We just concluded one meeting in Anchorville area. We are in your area now. And then I think we're going to Miss Phoebe yeah. after this. This is part, as mentioned by Chairman, is a part of a series of outreaches that are being conducted by ministers throughout the entire course. And after we would have completed the course, we will then venture into the hinterland regions. This also is a promise that we made when we campaigned in 2020. As we know that there is a perception, and people love to say that you only see politicians and ministers when it's election time. And I know a lot of people say that. A lot of people say, oh, they're going to come when it's time to vote. Well, there is no election close by now. But we are here. We are here because we promised you that. We promised you that after we get into government, that we will keep engaging you, whether it's at the NDC level, at the local level, whether it's at the regional level, or whether it's at the national level, that we will keep coming to communities and villages and to consult with residents and to listen to your issues. So I am here primarily this afternoon to listen to what issues are affecting you, the residents, in this area, so that we can work together on addressing those issues to make your lives more comfortable because that is our responsibility as a government. That is why you voted for the People's Progressive Party Civic, so that we can go into government and we can create an environment where our people will work and they will live happily. They can provide for themselves and their families. They can send their children to school and they can live a peaceful, secure life. That is what we promise when we campaign. And that is our task as a government, that we will ensure that we put public infrastructure in place. We will ensure that you have proper health care. We will ensure that we improve the education system. And all of these we are working on right now. Chairman mentioned the biggest budget ever in the history of our country. And it means that once we are spending over a trillion dollars, that you will see development in your communities and in this region especially. And I can tell you that Borbis is a priority region for us. As a matter of fact, the two fastest growing region in the country is region three and region six. These are the two fastest growing region in the country. And we will see even more growth in region six, especially when that bridge is completed in the Quarantine River linking Suriname to Guyana. We will see massive inflow of people our tourism industry will be boosted. Our trading will be boosted because Suriname offers us a gateway into the European market, which we can export our products through. So there are many opportunities that will come through that. CGX, as you know, has been drilling for oil in the Quarantine River right here, and they have discovered oil. Last year, we made a discovery. However, one discovery don't lead to development or production. They have to continue doing appraisal work to determine whether the quantity of oil that is discovered here is commercial quantity or not. Meaning if it is feasible to actually ex expend money to start producing. And I'm sure soon we'll make a decision on that. If you look at the Palmyra area, you will see massive development taking place there. And what all these developments do, it creates jobs for people. It creates opportunity for the private sector. And that is important. Once people get jobs, it's important. Because it, there was a time in Barbies where the unemployment rate was very high. It was so high that people were leaving Barbies and go to Georgia and work, or go to Suriname, or go to other countries. Some people were using their visitor visa to go to America and work for five months and come home back because there was no job. The estates were closed, there was no economic activity, there was no development taking place. We will need 
hundreds of workers when the stadium start it's already started but when we start in full to build out that stadium at Palmyra you will need hundreds of workers there sheriff company is building a hospital right there too a private hospital you will need hundreds of workers two hotels are building there you will need hundreds of workers the government and Exxon is building the hospitality institute right here in Port Moran you will need hundreds of workers <coughs> The new Amsterdam hospital is being rebuilt. Or as a matter of fact, not rebuilt. But we are building a new, new Amsterdam hospital. If you go across the, the, the Kanji Bridge, you know where the mental compound is. Or where mental ground used to be. That will be where the new, new Amsterdam hospital is being built. We are building a new hospital at number 75 village. And as Dr. Madhu said, when these hospitals are completed, you don't have to go to Georgetown to get medical care. In fact, people might have to come to Borbis to get medical care. So Rinamis, like they were coming to go to the ophthalmology hospital, they might very well have to come to Guyana to get medical care. That is the new Guyana that we are building out. But it will not happen overnight. I can assure you that by 2030, this country will not be the same. It will be a totally different country, but for the positive we will see massive development taking place in this country. Already we are seeing that. Already we are seeing that. And people have realized that once you have land and once you have property in Borbisa or in Guyana, you don't sell anymore. You don't see people selling the property anymore because people have confidence in the government and in the economy. If foreign investors are coming so much, it means that they have confidence in the government. They have confidence in this country. Guyana is one of the fastest growing economy in the world. A few years ago, when we used to visit, when we used to go to the conferences, nobody knew about Guyana. They asked you if Guyana is in Africa. That's the first thing people ask you. Nobody knew where Guyana was. They mistake Guyana for Guinea and Ghana. Today, the whole world knows where Guyana is. Today, the whole world wants to come to Guyana. Today, many of our people are coming back from Venezuela, from Suriname, from Trinidad, from Barbados, even America. People are coming back to Guyana now because things are getting better here. And sometimes we need to be honest with ourselves. And if we look around, we will see progress. We will see development taking place. I'm sure a couple of years ago, this was a mud dam. We had no light, we had no water. I'm a Barbician, I know. I was born in Edinburgh Village, and I grew up in New Amsterdam. So I know about Barbies, and I know the state of which Barbies used to be. Most of these areas used to be squatting area. The entire Belvedere Topu area used to be a squatting area, with no light, no road, no water, no telephone. Today, look at the difference. So it shows you that we are getting better, but it takes time to get there. However, as a country, we are in a better position now because of oil and gas because we are getting more revenue now. So when we come to you and you said that the street is bad, before we used to wait two, three years to fix it. Now sometimes you get it fixed in two, three months, or even less, or even less, because we are in a better position, because we are earning more revenue from oil and gas. Even though we are not getting the full amount, or we are not getting true benefit from it as yet, because we, are now, we have now started we have already started to use that money or use that revenue to one, improve our health care, which is very important. Our infrastructure, which is our road drainage is important. Our education system as well, we need to improve on all of that. And right here in Port Moran, the president was here last week to open the Oil and Gas Institute. Right here in Port Moran. President will be back soon to turn the sod for the Hospitality Institute, right. which will be built right here. Right. Friday, the president will be here. The turn is sought to build the hospital, Hospitality Institute right here in Morbis. You have the University of Guyana just a stone throw away from here. And, that, and the president has made a promise, and it's in our manifesto, that within this fourth term in office, we will make the University of Guyana or University of Education, University of Education free. So it means that every single young person <clears throat> coming out of high school 
can go to the university and acquire a tertiary education. And that is important because if you look at any developed country around the world, they have an educated population. Unfortunately, many of us here, especially the senior folks, you didn't have the opportunity because you went through the bad times in this country. You went through the dictatorship, the rig election, the banned goods days, when the debt was so high, when we couldn't build a street, much as pay our debt, you went through those days. So you didn't have the opportunity. Many of us, you, you have the ability, but you were never really given the opportunity as the young people today are getting. So as parents, let us encourage the young people to take advantage of it. The government, we have 20,000 online scholarship program, on, online scholarship on the program. The minister complained to me one time because she knew I'm a Barbician. She said that Barbies people are not applying for the scholarship. We, to, we need to take advantage of that. You have a university year. By next year, maybe it's be free. President will announce at some point in time. Let us ensure that our children are qualified because there will be many opportunities coming. I mentioned to you the new Guyana that is being created and what will happen by 2030. But it also requires our people to be educated and to be certified. That is why we are building the Oil and Gas Institute. Because we have some of the best welders, some of the best mechanics, but they're not certified. And in the oil and gas sector, you have to get a certificate. Otherwise, they will not employ you. Some of our people can weld better than the ones that come from America and all over, but you don't have the certificate. But you've been in the welding shop with your grandfather, your father, right up. And you can do any type of welding, but you just don't have the certificate. So that's the purpose of the Oil and Gas Institute coming here. So that our people can go there, you can certify, get your certificate, and you can work directly in the oil and gas sector. Because what we have done as a government is unprecedented. You know, a lot of, a lot of, a lot of negatives are being said every day about the oil and gas sector, especially in Kaiju News. But if you look at the way our sector is developing, it has never happened like that any part of the world. Any part of the world. There are countries that took 30 years to set up a Natural Resource Fund Act. We did that in two years. There are many countries where they have a local content policy. We moved a local content law demanding that the oil companies must employ Guyanese, demanding that they must purchase goods and services from Guyanese. Today we find the products from Blackbush going on the drill ship of Shore Guyana because we have a lot to say that 75% of the food that goes offshore must be purchased from Guyanese. That is what we would have done. So that was done to create opportunities. It was done to create opportunities because in many oil producing countries, the people don't benefit directly from the sector. That is, they don't get to work in the oil and gas sector and they don't get to provide goods and services to the oil and gas companies. The only way they benefit is from the revenue coming into the government and the government using it to build out infrastructure and to provide social services. That's the only way they benefit. We are changing that. We are saying that our people will benefit from the revenue when we build infrastructure, when we improve the education system, when the university is free, the online scholarship, when we build new hospitals, our people will benefit. And we are further saying that our young people especially can be qualified and work in the oil and gas sector. And that our private sector, including our farmers, including everyone who's, who's providing a service that is needed offshore, that they can supply to oil companies. That is what we are doing today in the oil and gas sector. And that is why we have seen so much investment coming into Guyana. And soon we will see some coming to Barbies, especially with CGX finding oil in the quarantine block and a refinery being built in Borbis. These are developments that will take place, that will bring a number of investors to Borbis. So <clears throat> I want to assure you that Borbis, and we've always heard that we focus too much resources in Region 4, but I want to assure you that the resources are being spread in every single region. Today in Borbis, we have built over 500 roads. Over 500 roads we've already built. The main road from New Amsterdam to Molson Creek 
will be upgraded. As a matter of fact, the contract was already awarded and that should start soon. If you pass by Palmyra, you, you probably see the block off the road. It is because they're building a wider culvert so that we can widen the road. We're going to rebuild the road from New Amsterdam all the way to Molson Creek. Widen it, cap it back so they become a highway. All of that will happen, in, it will start this year in Region 6. The community roads, we will ensure that every single community road in Region 6 is built. That is something that we can commit to. Already we have built over 500, and we are in the process of building a few hundreds more. In this year budget, there is provision to do even more, and then that will continue. Next year we are going to do another set. So I can assure you in another two years from now, every single street will be in a better condition. In a better condition. We are working to address the biggest issue that we have in our country. Because many of us, at the ending of the month, you don't want to see your light bill. Because that is the biggest problem. So we, we realize that, and we are working to address that. You probably heard, if you listen to the Vice President press conferences every Thursday, he would normally speak about the gas energy project. Well, the gas energy project, that project is going to deliver reliable and cheap electricity to all of us. So it means that in another year or so from now, your light bill will be reduced by half. So if you're paying 15,000 now, in another year from now, you will pay 7,500. It means more money, more savings in your pocket. It means that you can do other things with that money. It means that you can improve your standard of living. And it will also reduce the cost of living because we know, we are fully aware that the cost of living has increased. We are fully aware of that. And that is why we would have taken a number of steps to cushion the cost of living. But I know that you are aware that the cost of living issue is a global issue. It is not specific to Guyana. All part of the world is suffering from increasing cost of living. Talk to your families in America, Canada, wherever they live, they tell you the same thing. Everything has increased in price. Mainly because of COVID and the war in Ukraine. And once oil price increased, every single thing increased. And that is why we would have ensured that we took off tax or fuel. So we are probably one of the few countries in the world where we don't pay no tax on fuel at all. So the government don't make any money off fuel because we don't want you to pay a higher price for it. The cash grant that we give back to our children, that is to ensure to assist parents. Every child in our country now will receive, this year will receive $45,000. The $40,000 cash grant and the $5,000 uh, uniform voucher. That will happen this year. And we made a promise that by next year, we will take the cash grant up to $50,000. And that will happen next year because we have always delivered on our promise. We promise that we will double the old age pension. When we took over government, it was $20,000. And we will stand by our promise that by next year, it will reach $40,000, double. We have promised that we will increase public service, the, the public assistance. It is now sixteen or $17,000. We have promised that our pensioners will receive an NIS pension, that you too will see an increase. That has increased from 35,000 to 43,000 because we know that many of our people work in the sugar estates and you're not only receiving old age pension, but you're also receiving a pension from NIS too. So that too has increased and we will continue to ensure that we provide more and more assistance to cushion the cost of living. The project that I spoke of that will reduce electricity, it will reduce cost of living. Because then is when we can be able to manufacture our own products. And we don't have to depend on China and other countries where our products are coming from. It is because of that that there's an increase in cost. If we were producing our own products here, we wouldn't have felt the impact of the cost of living. And that project when we have cheap, reliable electricity, we will ensure that we start making almost every single thing. Because if you look at it today, we don't produce much. Right? Yes, we have rice, we have sugar, we have natural resources. But we don't produce. We don't make these plastic bottles in Guyana. We import it 
and then we fill the water inside. Even toothpick, you check your toothpick box, you're gonna see made in China. Yeah. And we have one of the biggest forests in the world here. But we import toothpick from China. If you look at the plastic spoon that you eat with, it comes from some other country. So what I'm saying is that we need to manufacture all these things right here in the end. And the reason why we haven't attracted investors to do that, our local people have never opened up factories to do that, was because of the high cost of electricity. So once this gas to energy project is completed next year, we will see a number of local and foreign investors investing in manufacturing, making our products right here in Guyana. And making your own products is beneficial to any country. You look at any country that's developed, China, India, America, many of these countries, they produce every single thing that they consume. We import almost everything that we consume. That has to change. And that now will bring a whole host of benefits to it. It means that it will create jobs for more people. It will create business opportunities for more people because you too can start up a little business. You could probably make toothpick. Right now we gotta import it from China. These are small businesses that people can do. Sometimes we only think, <clears throat> we think that we gotta import these things, but really and truly, we gotta start being more inno innovative and we got to start believing that we can do different things. And that is why the government distributed the cash grant that was given to many people. And that will be given soon again. The idea behind the cash grant was to ensure that people get an opportunity or assistance to start up a small business. That was the idea of the cash grant. To start up a small business so that you can generate an income and you create employment for yourself. So that is the idea. So we want the people who benefit from it to use it for its intended purpose. Some people here, you buy electric scooter. They go on a sport. The money done, but they didn't do nothing. Which is wrong, right? But we don't come and micromanage it. We expect that when we give it to people who really need it, they will use it to establish a little business that will generate income for them. We have heard too, a whole set of issues about a selection, who get and who didn't get. We are, we are aware of that, that there is a problem with that. But at the same time, people need to be <coughs> honest with the officials too. You need to be honest with us too. I'm speaking generally, not you. But people generally need to be honest with the government. You require us to be honest, but you gotta be honest to us. If you know a man get already, you gotta say you get already. Or if you know you get already, you can't come again. And that's what's happening. That's what's happening. One person coming three times. And when you ask him, you get, he said, no, me never get. But when you check the record, he don't collect already. A man collect, his wife collect, his son collect, his dad collect. That's unfair. Right, it's unfair. But you can't expect the vice chairman and the chairman to know everybody and who's who's son and who's who's daughter. It's difficult, sometimes we got a different name too. Sometimes we got different address too. How are they gonna know all who that and who son? If I come to your village now, I can't know who related to who. But we expect people to be honest. And give the people who really need it a chance to get it. It takes honesty to build good relations. And if you expect the government to be honest, then the people gotta be honest to us too. Because we are trying to help at the same time. So we, because we are doing all of this because we recognize that the cost of living has increased and people need some kind of assistance. That is why we are doing it. That is why when we came into government, we give a COVID cash grant. We give a cash grant to the pensioners, to the police officers, give back them their bonus because we realize that cost of living has increased. So I'm saying, I'm mentioning all these things to you, comrades, so that we have a fair understanding as to where our country is headed. And that this process of nation building is a partnership between government and people. And when I say government, I don't necessarily mean central government. We have at the local government level, you have a very good chairman here, Pandit Armagan, right? But he needs support, right? And he's, the, he's a pundit, he's not God. He can't fix all the issue. Like we go over, so they expect the poor man to fix all the issue. Like they forget he is the pundit and he's not the God. 
Right? You can't fix all the issue. If you raise 99 issue here today, today right now, I'm not fixed that. I can assure you I can't fix I cannot fix all. But I'll try. And I'll probably fix most. But I cannot fix all. And if we fix all tomorrow morning and we come the next day again, you will have all the issues again. Because it's natural. I don't blame you, you will have issues. That's why there's a government. So when I say working with the government, I don't mean central government only. Work with the NDC. Work with the RDC. You have a very good RDC here too. Probably one of the most experienced regional chairmen in our country. And Mr. Armagon. Right? And you know Mr. Armagon is a man who is very accommodating and helpful. You have the REO, who is my personal friend. And I know his commitment to his job and getting things done in Borbis. Right, the chairman mentioned a whole host of government officials that we have here, and I know most of them personally, and I know that they're committed to making your lives better, but we have to work together. If we come here and complain about everything under the sun and blame the government for everything under the sun, we won't get anywhere, trust me. We're not going to get anywhere. Because we go to some community, and if your front drain is clean, you blame the government. Rain fall a little too hard, you blame the government. You step board follow, then you fall along boss here, you blame the government. People are in the habit now of blaming the government for anything and becoming too dependent. Becoming too dependent. And I want to close by <clears throat> making one last statement. Because as I mentioned, I want to listen to you too. A couple months ago, we had a headline in the newspaper. Kaicho News, of course. People are starving in oil-rich Guyana. That was the headline, I'm sure you saw it too. People are starving in oil-rich Guyana. But we need to tell Kaicho News and everybody else that people will starve anywhere in the world if they don't work. If you don't work, you will starve anywhere you go. You go to America, you're going to become a bomb on Liberty Avenue, sleeping on the street and starving in the great America if you don't work. So this perception that they're trying to create at all when we start producing oil, everybody's supposed to get rich. Sometimes it don't happen like that. It takes time, it takes a, it's a process. Guyana will get better, I can assure you that. Maybe that's a promise I can make, because I know it will happen. I know it will happen under our president and our government. I know that by 2030, this country will be far better than what it is today. That is what I can promise you, because we are working towards that. And I can promise you that your lives will be better by 2030 than it is today. And I, I can also promise you that every single Guyanese, whether you or your child or whoever, will benefit in some way or the other. Whether you get a house lot, whether you get a cash grant and you start up a small business, whether your child is going to the university and you don't have to pay for it, or any other way or form that the government will assist you. Whether you get a new concrete road in front of your yard, whether you get street lights through your street, you will benefit in some way or the other. Your electricity bill being 50% less than we used to pay, you're benefiting in some way or the other. And this thing about the electricity bill is not a dream I'm selling. We're not campaigning for election. I'm telling you that this will happen. The project has already started. And you will see in another year from now, your light bill being reduced by 50%. And I believe that is what everybody wants. And we are going to deliver on that. I can assure you of that too. So, comrades, let me close by thanking you for coming out and being so very attentive too. It, your presence here this afternoon means that you're serious about the development of your community. That you want to hear what is happening in your country. And also that you hold the government, whether it's local, regional, or national, responsible for development in your country and that you hold us to strict accountability and transparency. And I want you to do that, because we are answerable to you, especially the oil and gas sector, of which I'm the minister responsible. I can assure you of strict accountability and transparency, regardless of what you read in Kaichu News every single day. This is not a cake shop operation with turning a pipe and you start fetching away oil. It don't work like that. But I'll come back at some point in time where we can have meetings and discuss oil and gas only so that we can explain to you exactly how the sector functions and how it works. Because people believe some of these 
misinformation, mainly because you don't understand how the sector works. So we are going to do start a series of meetings very soon that speak specifically about oil and gas, and for you to ask any question, and we will answer the question. <laughs>